surgery for colon and rectal cancer. Very important to recognize that surgery is the primary modality for curing patients with colon and rectal cancer. I don't say that just because I'm a surgeon, but in fact it's been well proven for decades before we had effective other treatments. Certainly for early stage disease, and uh, that is unfortunately the minority of patients that we see presenting with colon and rectal cancer, it is the only therapy required. That has just such huge advantages for the patients in terms of not needing to undergo toxicities of other treatments beyond the surgery. And, um, and in fact, obviously, it's the uh, fact that it's an early stage of disease that means that they're likely to be long-term survivors. Certainly, adjuvant therapy in the form of chemotherapy and radiation for uh, properly uh, selected cancers increases the likelihood of cure. In fact, these therapies apply to most patients who present today with colon and rectal cancer. However, that those therapies do not make up for inadequately done surgery. And in fact, unless a patient is treated uh, curatively with their surgery and completely, these adjuvant therapies are unlikely to benefit them in a, a great deal. We need to make screening easier for patients in order to be able to see patients with earlier stage disease. The uh, patients who have colorectal cancer frequently require multidisciplinary care in order to have an, uh, an optimal outcome. It's not simply they're going to be treated by one discipline and that's going to be it. This is an example of uh, Dr. George Chang doing uh, laparoscopic surgery with one of our fellows. And it's been shown that such surgery for uh, properly selected cancers, not necessarily all colorectal cancers, uh, can result in very low uh, hospital stays and a reduction in the use of pain medication, and in some instances a quicker resumption of normal activities than our standard open surgery. Without any compromise, when the patients are properly selected. The ability to harvest greater than 12 uh, to 14 lymph nodes and examine them has been shown to be associated with a better survival across just about all the stages of resectable colon cancer. It's a very important and, and increasingly recognized fact that colorectal cancer can be um, an inherited disease. And in fact, we may not understand all the ways that it's inherited yet, but there are certainly instances where we do recognize well-described syndromes. Not every patient desires to, to have genetic testing in order to establish whether they have an inherited syndrome or not. There are certainly still fears about insurability and uh, discrimination related to genetic testing that should be dispelled. But that's an individual decision. Colon cancer is different than rectal cancer. And, uh, you know, that, that is something that is often lost when patients uh, turn up in the clinic and nobody's explained to them that the management of rectal cancer is more complex than colon cancer. Once the, the clinical staging is done, and by that we mean the staging that relies upon testing, such as CT scans of the chest, abdomen, and pelvis, as well as a test called an endorectal ultrasound that tells us the depth of penetration of the tumor and whether or not there are already enlarged lymph nodes around the cancer, as well as the presence or absence of distant metastases. We can come up with a clinical TNM staging. And based upon that initial clinical staging, a treatment plan is devised. If it's a very early cancer, then surgery alone can be used. If it's a uh, stage two or three rectal cancer, patients will receive preoperative chemotherapy and radiation. And that's before we have a, uh, a specimen or a pathology report that comes back and says it's such and such a stage. So it's really important to understand that in rectal cancer, the clinical staging is what drives the treatment. This is an example of how the, um, the treatment of rect uh, rectal cancer differs from the treatment of colon cancer. Still requires surgery for curative therapy, and then patients may go on to other uh, additional treatments if indicated by their stage. This is the most common operation done for uh, 
rectal cancer is called a low anterior resection. Those patients avoid a permanent colostomy. It's a pretty straightforward deal. However, the truth is that many of our patients have tumors that are lower in the rectum. Now, overall, greater than 80% of patients who present with rectal cancer are going to be spared a permanent colostomy. So the idea that someone should be afraid to deal with symptoms or go to the doctor for rectal bleeding or a change in bowel habits out of fear that they're going to end up with a permanent colostomy, that really has to be dispelled among the public. In many times in years past, if the tumor could be felt on rectal exam, which means that it's roughly, you know, anywhere between zero to uh, five or six centimeters from the anal verge from the outside, those patients would be treated automatically with an what's called an abdominal perineal resection, which is an operation that adequately removes this cancer, but ends up with a permanent colostomy. That is markedly different today than it used to be, markedly different. By the use of preoperative chemotherapy and radiation, tumors such as this can be converted after the chemotherapy and radiation to a tumor that is lower in volume and smaller. And what that allows us to do is it allows us to do a much more sophisticated low rectal cancer operation that restores the patient's continuity of their GI tract and avoids a permanent colostomy. And because of that, the patient's quality of life is going to be improved after this care, and they can get on with their lives in a more normal fashion. Of course, for patients who do require a colostomy for adequate removal of their tumor, there is no question that that is what should be done. And in fact, those patients will go on to have an amazingly good quality of life in almost all instances. This is an example of an operation that is probably the most common one that I do. This is called a proctectomy and a coloanal anastomosis, where the rectum is removed down to the top of the anal canal. Then we go through the anal canal and cut the rectum free, assure the patient that they have a uh, clear margin, and then the GI continuity is restored by bringing the colon down into the anal canal and either sewing it directly into the anal canal end to end, or making a J-shaped pouch that increases the reservoir function of the rectum and can somewhat reduce the bowel abnormalities that are produced by this sort of surgery in, 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 in an effort to improve the patient's quality of life. So we're not giving up any aspect of the cancer control in order to do sphincter preservation when it's done appropriately and with the use of preoperative adjuvant therapy. What about patients with metastatic disease? That's an important thing that Dr. Eng started to address. This is an algorithm where patients go from the diagnosis of liver metastases. Some patients are unresectable and go on to the treatments that um, Dr. Eng outlined. Others, however, will, if they're immediately resectable, they can go on to some systemic therapy first in order to uh, prevent progression in other organs. I mean, why do patients die of colorectal cancer? They die of colorectal cancer because of distant metastases almost all the time. It's not due to the primary tumor in their GI tract. And control of those uh, distant metastases has advanced greatly in the last seven or eight years. While surgery remains the definitive component of curative treatment, even patients with metastatic colorectal cancer can be can benefit from surgery either due to um, reduction of their tumor and potential increase in survival, as well as relief of symptoms, and therefore they may have an improved quality of life. This is an example of a patient who had uh, bilobar liver metastases, treated uh, had 16 different tumors in seven of eight anatomic segments of the liver, went on to have uh, chemotherapy to reduce the sizes of the tumors, go on to have uh, actually two operations to remove their liver metastases. And then you can see their normal liver has grown back here after the resections. Another uh, technique that's used is ablation, which is the use of radiofrequency to ablate these tumors. One more example of how our liver surgeons are always doing something. This patient has a very small left lobe of their liver. You need a certain volume of liver left in order to survive. 
And in this case, what they did is a portal vein embolization, which is blockage of one of the blood vessels to the left side, hypertrophy of the liver because of that blockage. That allowed them to de then do the resection of the portion of the liver bearing the tumor, leaving enough viable liver for the patient to survive and do well. Last example of uh, treatments for metastatic disease. This is for patients who have uh, disease spread on the lining of the abdominal cavity. This is a form of uh, perfusion of the abdominal cavity after debulking those tumors. It's perfusion with a hyperthermic solution containing chemotherapy that can get to all the surfaces on the lining of the abdominal cavity 